Welcome to Med City News' final day of the Invest Digital Health Conference. My name is Orunduti Parmar. I'm the editor in chief of Med City News. Welcome all to the startups, to the audience, to the judges who are here today. I'll start by sharing my screen and talk a little bit about, um, about Med City News. Give me a second. I should have had it in slideshow format. Uh, so like I said, I'm the editor-in-chief of Med City News. We were founded in late 2008 to cover innovation in healthcare. We're a national publication. I'm sorry, I'm, I thought I was sharing, but I guess I'm not. Uh, we're a national publication drawing nearly 2 million page views and 500 uniques per month. We cover biopharma, digital health, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as hospitals and payers in the context of the industry's overall transformation. And of course, are really, we are really paying close attention to COVID-19. Uh, Man City also hosts conferences focusing on investment, population health, precision medicine, digital health, and patient engagement. We accept outside content through influencers program. So if there is, um, a topic that you're really interested in writing about, please get in touch with me. Uh, my email will be placed in the chat. Um, we do accept content, but it has to be non-promotional. Um, we also have a new program called Met Citizens. It's a sub subscription-based membership program for startups with editorial and event benefits. Recently, we launched the Met City Pivot podcast, uh, trying to sort of encapsulate what each of us are doing not only in our um, personal lives, but more importantly in our, in our business lives and how businesses are looking at various things from um, testing in COVID-19 to how to partner with pharma companies if you're a health tech, and of course, uh, policy as well. We had a really nice conversation with Zeke Emanuel the other day. So I urge you to go to the uh, site and click on the Pivot um, podcast link. Um, the link that mentioned here will also be placed in the slide. And again, if there is a very interesting personality that you think should be featured on the podcast, please do email me and let me know. So I wanted to say a big thank you to all our sponsors, Unity Point Health Ventures, Fredrickson and Byron and Deloitte. They, are, have, they have been really helpful in the last few years in supporting uh, several of our conferences. So I appreciate that. A big thank you to Medical Alley. Uh, Medical Alley Association is an industry association that's working to highlight innovation in the state of Minnesota. Their mission is to champion and facilitate an environment that enables health technology and care organizations to innovate, succeed, and influence the evolution of healthcare. So I just want to go over the, con uh, the contest ground rules. We have five employee benefit startups today. Each startup has 10 minutes, four minutes to pitch, six minutes with uh, Q&A with the judges. The time will be enforced pretty strictly. At the end of the five presentations, we will hold a poll, an audience poll, to determine an audience favorite from today's pitch session. And then the winners, uh, formal winners, from based on judges' scores, will be announced next Monday. I also wanted to point out that in the audience, you will hear me say one minute left to give the startups a sort of verbal cue that they have 60 seconds left. Now it's time to meet the judges. First up, we have Jennifer Hart. She's the Director of Investments at ben, ben Franklin Technology Partners, Michael Yang, Managing Partner at Omer's Ventures, and Joel Nelson, VP of Innovation at United Healthcare. A little more in-depth about our judges. Uh, Jen Hart uh, directs all of Ben Franklin's life sciences related investments in companies with technologies ranging from clinical healthcare IT, medical devices, and diagnostics to therapeutics. Hart has closed 140 investments totaling over $33 million in over 70 companies for Ben Franklin since early 2006. She's very experienced with early stage boards and debt and equity investment instruments in addition to assessing investment opportunities and plans. Hart holds a master's in biology and bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Jennifer. Michael. Based in Palo Alto, Michael Yang is a managing partner for Omer's Ventures, a multi-stage venture capital firm where he focuses on investments in the health tech, insure tech, and prop tech sectors. Prior to joining OV, Michael was a managing director for Comcast Ventures and a VP and GM at Yahoo. He holds an MBA from Harvard and a BS from the Wharton School of 
University of Pennsylvania. Michael sits on the board of Accolade and Peerwell and was previously an investor in companies such as Body Media, Brightside, Healthline, and Telex. Welcome, Michael. Then we have Joel. Joel Nelson is the Vice President of Innovation for United Healthcare. His team leads strategic growth opportunities that span across UHC, including nascent technology and business model exploration with partners large and small, facilitated in part by the United Healthcare Accelerator powered by Techstars, which he co-founded. To this work, Joel brings his own background of entrepreneurship and innovation exploration, having built his own startups externally and within large organization. He's an active angel investor and is a newly converted northerner, having moved from the western states to Minneapolis, where now that his wife and three kids have experienced the summer lake life, will never move anywhere else. You didn't add, Joe, that you probably have no problems with snow, which led me to move away from Minnesota. Joel holds an MBA from the University of Utah and a BS from the University of Las Vegas. Welcome, Joel. Here are our five intrepid finalists, Dynamic Care Health, Care Tribe, Beyond Lucid Technologies and Consulting, Teatros, and My Med Choices. First up, we have Dynamic Care Health. It is a digital care program that helps monitor and motivate people to quit or moderate drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. Results from three clinical studies have shown that Dynamic Care increases quit rates by two to three times compared to typical treatment. Dynamic Care is working with major employers and health plans such as Horizon, Blue Cross, Blue Shield of New Jersey, Harvard Pilgrim, Aetna, and Anthem, Eric Gasprin, Guest friend, co-founder, and CEO will be our first presenter. I'll stop sharing. Eric, and please go ahead, uh, launch your presentation. Thank you so much. I'm Eric Gastrand. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Dynamic Care Health, the digital care program for substance use. I started this company four years ago with my father, Dr. David Gastrand, who's a national expert in addiction psychiatry. After having seen friends and family members go through addiction, relapse, rehab, and eventually recovery. Since starting the company, we've achieved great recognition from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, three grants from the National Institutes of Health, and a million dollar prize from the state of Ohio in recognition of how we've improved outcomes there for the opioid epidemic. We're also working with health systems, uh, providers, and employers around the country, including St. Elizabeth Healthcare in Kentucky, and major uh, payers such as Aetna, Horizon, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Jersey, and Anthem, which recently awarded us a platinum award in their Fast Track to Scale Accelerator uh, in recognition of our successful pilot with one of their major employer customers. Addiction is one of the biggest problems facing the healthcare system. There are 40 million people in the US clinically addicted to drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. It's a huge problem for employers because 10% of full-time employees meet the clinical criteria for drug or alcohol addiction. And this has only gotten worse due to COVID. In addition to the enormous human suffering caused by addiction, there is also a major financial burden on the healthcare system with over $1,300 in monthly excess costs due to drug and alcohol addictions. And this is what Dynamic Care seeks to address through cost-effective, scalable technology and a comprehensive digital care program. Our program, like other digital health companies such as Omada, Livongo, or Hinge Health, combines technology, coaching, and connected hardware to provide comprehensive support through the chronic disease recovery process. We match each member with a recovery coach who is a peer in recovery who works with them on a telehealth model through voice, video, and chat. We provide remote substance testing to our members, breath and saliva tests. And if you look at my webcam, you can see we ask members to do selfie videos of themselves at random times, breathing into the Bluetooth connected breathalyzer. So we know whether they're achieving their health goals or not. And then for drugs, uh, opioid stimulants, we do selfie videos of saliva tests. Swab your cheek, put the swab in the cup, see a color change on the cup, so that we actually have a way to biometrically verify how our members are doing. We do appointment tracking using GPS, self-guided therapy content in the app, and we provide family services because addiction is a disease that affects the whole family. 
We tie everything together with motivational incentives, which have been demonstrated in over 100 randomized controlled trials to dramatically improve outcomes. And the end result is a digital care program that comprehensively supports people anytime, anywhere, and has achieved very high customer satisfaction with a net promoter score of 72. Employers like us because we work across substances, opioids, stimulants, alcohol, tobacco. We support abstinence or moderation as goals, and we can be deployed in various settings as complementary to treatment or as a standalone wellness program. Our three clinical studies with academic research partners have demonstrated that we've improved quit rates by two to three X across drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. Our business model can be pay for engagement or pay for performance. The pay for engagement model is $290 per member per month uh, actively engaged, uh, plus un up to $100 per month for the financial incentives. And for the pay for performance model, we charge less for the engagement than more if we're demonstrating sobriety or achieved health goals. To sum it up, we're uh, tackling a massive problem. We have a clinically effective solution that's been demonstrated, and we have a strong team with clinical and tech expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Let's first go to Jennifer, and then we'll go to Michael, and then Joel. Hi there. So I have a couple of questions about, um, first, do you mind flipping back to the slide on quit rates? I just want to understand, um, is, I think you have a good proposition here to tap the employer benefits market because an incentive for many who are functional in their addiction is to retain employment. So right there, you have some good incentive alignment. Um, incentive alignment is always incredibly necessary in addiction treatment. People have to be wanting to get clean and sober. Um, so it is. it always is a little tricky to navigate, but making it be that they also wanna keep their employ employment can be a good incentive. Can you just though walk me through, because I wanna know that your data is gonna sell the employers on that outcome. How long is this measured? How are you measuring that increased quit rate? It's over how long? I couldn't see that in the um, footnotes. Sure, so the uh, study on the left was a four month study. Um, the one in the middle was uh, three months. Um, the one on the right uh, was a six month study. So based on these initial results that we've done with uh, government funding and our academic research partners at Johns Hopkins and University of Vermont, um, we're now funded by the NIH to uh, do larger scale up trials over a 12 month period. Uh, so we were recently awarded $1.6 million grant for that. So our initial uh, studies with you know rigorous control groups uh, have been over shorter periods and now we're working on longer periods and that's compared to what what is the alternative yeah for the uh two studies on the left um everyone was in outpatient treatment so dynamic care was added as a complement to that and then the study on the right the control group has access to a telephonic quit line for smoking cessation and this is among pregnant women okay um, yeah, the more and better the data to sell to employers, the better. And 12-month data would be great. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. We'll go to Michael. Thanks. Hi, Eric. Uh, great, great mission here. Great problem to be solving. Um, two questions. How do you get employees to self-nominate themselves that they have uh, an issue here and to actually enroll into your programs. And then um, I'm curious what um, type of utilization kind of data do you have in terms of um, percent of the population that you're serving uh, for an employer actually kind of staying with the program and then how long do they actually stay with the program? Sure, so um, I think there were three parts to the question, if I remember correctly. Um, first, how do we reach the members? So uh, we can do kind of, you know, the standard things of uh, mass communications, on-site, webinars. Um, I think because we offer smoking cessation, which is less stigmatized than the other two, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol, it offers an easy way to um, you know, talk about dynamic care, bring it up and get people interested in talking about it. 
And uh, there are some larger employers where members will self-refer to the EAP, and of course that can be a referral source. We also work with the health plan and the local addiction treatment programs that anyone showing up for a treatment program with that health plan or that employer's plan um, can be referred to our program. Uh, with our payer pilots, uh, with the health plans, um, among the members that we've uh, gotten in contact with, 80 to 90% have enrolled in the program. Um, so when those referrals are made to us, and uh, in terms of retention, our month four retention rate is uh, 67% right now. So it's a, a good retention rate. And also if you compare us to uh, typical in-person treatment, we've actually been able to demonstrate dramatically higher retention in our program than for typical treatment um, in all of our pilots. So I think it's, uh, important to recognize also for, you know, looking at the outcomes that the traditional treatment programs have very poor outcomes um, and generally don't retain people past six months, don't have much evidence of their effectiveness other than the methodologies they're using. So Dynamic Care is really paving the way forward for that in digital health. Thank you. No, no further questions. Thanks, Michael. Let's go to Joel. Hi there. Um, See, so can't get my video to go, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, so agreed. Thanks for working on this problem. Clearly, something that we care deeply about within our plans. Um, oh, there we go. How many people are using your platform today? Um, we don't give out those numbers publicly. We've had about a thousand members uh, go through the program over the course of our history. And how long have you been operating? Four years. Four years. How, how long have your programs, let's say a year later, what's the, what are the outcomes looking like for the members that have been on your program? Uh, a lot of our pilots initially have been three to six month pilots. Um, so we don't necessarily have that uh, year long data. Um, and uh, the payers are currently doing some analysis on the members who have been through our program, looking at what happens uh, you know, after that three to six month pilot period is over, um, crunching some numbers around that, but we don't have uh, the results from the payers yet for those analyses. Okay. How long are the coaches usually involved? Is it for the entire pilot or do they? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and actually our, our uh, current like preferred model that we're moving forward with is a 12 month coaching program where we apply rewards for the first five to six months of the program. Um, and so that's the model that we're launching with now in some of our larger contracts with the payers. Okay. Uh, maybe similar to a previously asked question, but I'm just kind of curious from the experience of side of the members, mm -hmm. um, their willingness to participate with coaching versus with the actual devices that you ask them to use and how your experience is differentiated to get them to actually carry those with them, pick them up, use them, how, crucial are those to the success of your program? Yeah, so the coaching is a very popular feature. And actually, when we originally launched Dynamic Air, it was without the coaching. Um, and we added the coaching uh, about a year and a half ago. And once we added the coaching, we saw dramatic improvements in the engagement rates and retention rates. Um, in terms of driving the usage of the device, keeping it with them, because they could get randomly tested any time. Um, the financial incentives really helps with that in the beginning um, because they can earn up to $100 a month by consistently testing negative. Um, but what we try to do over the course of the program is shift members from the motivational incentives being the motivation to accountability um, being the motivation. Some members want to be accountable to themselves. Um, other members mean loop in their support network um, through the family services that we offer whether it's family, AA sponsor, other supporters, and members can actually share their dynamic care dashboard data with their supporters to create another form of accountability. Um, and that can keep them motivated to do the substance test to demonstrate the progress that they're making beyond the financial incentive period. Just last question, and how are you measuring attribution for your cost savings within the pilots? Um, 
That I can't answer, but I think the uh, payers are working on that as they analyze the data from our pilots. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thanks very much. I had a very brief follow-up question. How do you route people into um, some other psychiatric care since there's often comorbidity? Is there a way to kind of trigger, backstop those kinds of issues? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, actually, we use a standardized uh, assessment called the American Society of Addiction Medicine co-triage um, mm -hmm. based on uh, principles developed by experts in addiction medicine, um, standardized questions through software that generates recommendations about what level of care a member needs, um, whether they need outpatient, inpatient. Okay. Uh, I just outpatient. wanted to be sure you had a backstop there. Yeah. I know we have to stay on time, but I appreciate the, the uh, thoughtfulness around that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eric. And we'll continue marching forward to the next presenter. My Med Choices works directly with consumers, self-insured employers, and government agencies to save money on their employees' planned health care. The startup's MCC Cerebro technology platform, combined with its professionally curated care plans for each patient, help improve patient experience and quality of care. Mary Swenson, founder and CEO, will be our next presenter. Welcome, Mary. Hello, my name is Mary, founder and CEO of MyMed Choices. We are a 100% woman-owned healthcare tech company. And um, I'm going to start with a story. I was raised in a small town, Eden Valley, Minnesota, and um, very rural town, only 700 people, and my mother died of an operable brain aneurysm. And I really didn't think she got the care, the choices, um, the options that she needed. So I ended up raising my five brothers and sisters. Now, I have dedicated my life to looking at the current healthcare system. That's what My Med Choices is about. It's about choices and options. It's about transparent pricing. It's about breaking down geographical borders. We, we call ourselves the... Amazon of healthcare, and this is all powered by our state-of-the-art technology. We consider ourselves the, an ecosystem of healthcare. So the first slide here is the problem. We have um, our self-funded organizations, which we work with, and we're seeing the cost of healthcare prices rise. <clears throat> My Med Choices can reduce your healthcare costs by 33%. We have planned surgeries. This is all the procedures that we cover. We contract with um, centers of excellence on transparent pricing. We send employees within the United States and outside the United States. Slide two. Slide two is the opportunity. Um, you may say to me, oh my gosh, Mary, you're in a travel for treatment business in the middle of this COVID. Um, what did you do? Well, we immediately pivoted to our telehealth platform. So now we're offering the telehealth with the second opinions. This also gave us a great opportunity to build out our case management software, which guides the patient through the system every step of the way, with also our HIPAA and JDPR medical records transfer system. So we're able to build out all this software. But as you can see, the market is, um, it's a very large market, and we know that it will be opening up, but currently leading with the telehealth and second opinion. Slide three is a solution. We have, so like I said previously, we have this ecosystem that we've brought everything together. So it's not just a broker system. It's not just a telehealth system. It's a bringing the employee in, um, guiding them through every stage of the planned surgery. And then we also have patent pending technology. Um, we're also in 10 different countries. We have over 400 healthcare providers and 30 global um, employers. The last slide is my team. And I have to brag a little. I have the top rock stars here in the industry, not just in health and wellness care, but technology. And i um, very proud of my team. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Mary. Let's go to Michael first, then we'll go to Jen and Joel. Hi, Mary. Great job. Uh, and, and I'm sorry about um, some, your, your, your loss. Um, with the regard to the business, um, how do you, who do you contract with? You know, uh, what, what is, you know, how do you particularly work with employers? And then um, now that you're squarely in telehealth and second opinions, there are some pretty large behemoths out there kind of operating in that space. Second opinions have been around for, for a while. So what is new and interesting about your mousetrap relative to the, uh, the incumbents? Great question. The first thing is we, we go to employers, we talk to the HR department, and they generally offer us as either an employee benefit or an add-on to, um, to their current healthcare system. We put together a portal, uh, they come in through the portal, we make money, they contract with us on um, episode of care. So we make money from the employer. And then we also make money from the hospitals for the referrals, not just within the United States, um, but outside the United States. One of our biggest contracts we just signed on was Ramsey, 480 hospitals, 11 countries. So um, what's different is, well, we have the, the telehealth, the second opinions, yes, but we also have the contracts. We have the major employers, we have the hospital systems, um, we have the hospitals, so that makes us different. What makes us different also is our case management technology, guiding the patient through, also providing the telehealth, and also the medical records transfer um, so people don't have to carry around their bulky files. It's all cloud-based. So we have the ecosystem is, is my answer to that. Um, not just strictly telehealth or strictly medical tourism. We provide um, the whole array of services. Okay. And then um, two more questions. How do you help your employers make their employees aware of the availability of a fine service such as yourself? And then um, today, where would you say you are strongest in terms of what surgical episodes, given the providers that you have in the network, you know, are you most optimized and most superior in, in kind of servicing on the patient side? Okay, great. What we do is we go to the employer uh, we look at their data, we look at what their biggest healthcare spend is. And on my very first slide, I saw I outlined the areas that we are the strongest in. Um, you know, the bariatric, the muscular skeletal, the, the cancer, the eye surgery. And then what we do is we create a portal. Um, we feature different doctors. So some of the employers may want to stay within their geographical area. Um, they don't want to leave the United States. Some people may say, well, you know, we want to be within the United States, but we do want to go to Singapore for transplant or, you know, um, uh, Australia for MS or something like that. So what we do is we have a portal. We always have fresh, new, interesting information. Um, we're constantly sending stuff out to employers. We're keeping them informed in what we're doing. Um, it's, there's all in those specific different areas. So some employers can tell their employees, you need to check my med choices first. Um, some may make it just an option, um, but we have you know, the transparent pricing. So we, we put information out to make it more attractive to the employees. Thank you, no further questions. Let's go to Jen, please. Hey, Mary. Um, Nice presentation going through the model. Uh, can you, though, clarify for us when you say we have, I'm trying to distinguish what's in the vision and the larger opportunity versus kind of where you are right now. Um, and I, because I think I want to understand from where you are right now, how you're vetting those services to get to that bigger picture how you're vetting what can be carried out well, because a lot of medical cases, um, even bariatric surgery, are going to have some idiosyncrasies. They're going to need a lot in the way of patient records and background. Um, they're not quite you know, as streamlined as some sorts of, say, dental work, for example. Um, you're getting into disease areas that, that are really interesting and where some real cost savings can happen for commercial plans, you know, employers could see a real 
um, benefit from this, but how are you vetting that and what do you have right now that gets you into that future bigger vision? Great question. Everything is built out. My Met Choices is completely built out. Uh, we have some tweaks with language that we're working on, but we have the telehealth, we have the case management software, the medical records. Uh, we have so the when you say medical records, I'm sorry, so you're right now sharing and transferring all these medical records out to a candidate doctor who would be potentially doing that bidding to take that patient? Yes. Okay. So, yes. And you're handling that versus the patient. You're actually being able to be that port. We're that portal. Okay. Um, we're working directly with the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So we do, like I say, the very first phone call to when they go home. We provide that. We take care of the entire episode of care, and we, we manage the patient through the whole episode of care. Mm -hmm. So you brought up a really great question. Centers of excellence are self-proclaimed centers. So I can say, I'm the best in bariatric, I'm the best in cancer care. Um, and that's what uh, part of our patent pending technology is looking at, but that's gonna be probably five years out. We're measuring the data. We have 12 uh, points that we're measuring. So we're looking at that. So currently the gauge we use is, of course, everyone has to be JCI accredited. They have to be JCI accredited, and we're only working with, you know, some of the major hospitals, the MD Andersons, the uh, Mayo Clinic, John Hopkins. We're working with the major Christiana Care, uh, CHOP. We're working with the major hospitals right now, and of course, they have to have uh, the JCI accreditation. When I work with um, international hospitals, um, they have to be TMOS accredited. Um, which were affiliated with TEMOS. So TEMOS is a international accrediting body, but they're, all the hospitals are JCI, and then it's one step above with the, uh, the accreditation. Plus, I have traveled for the last seven years to eight countries. I have personally been in the hospitals. I have personally uh, sign these contracts myself. I've gone out. So we're very, very selective in our referral process. So I'm not just referring to a bariatric clinic in Mexico because the price is $3,400. Um, it's, they go through a selection process. I've been there and we go through all that. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Let's go to Joel. All right, thanks. I am curious, when you talk about telehealth as a part of your platform, what does that mean? How much of the upfront triaging or, you know, primary care do you get into? How do you determine, you know, um, steerage to the, to the right hospital group? Well, Joe, a lot of people that approach us are just curious about what their options are. So we utilize the telehealth so that they can talk to someone in Singapore or they could talk to somebody in Minnesota or they could talk. So initially it is that meet and greet. Um, we're able to also pull up the medical documents so there can be co-doctoring and we go from there. Um, so it's a long process. Like we said, we're planned surgery. So it's not like we just somebody has a knee replacement, we say, okay, we're gonna send you to um, Washington State for your, for your knee surgery or, or whatever. This is a planned process that we go through. So we're utilizing the telehealth a lot more too in the wellness space. Uh, people are calling us up, they're, they're wanting to go to, we made a lot of referrals to Canyon Ranch. I mean, they want more of the wellness facility. So we're looking at our telehealth in the meet and greet, um, so they can familiarize themselves with the doctors, so we can do co-doctoring. Um, that's how we're utilizing the telehealth and second opinions um, and going from there. Can you tell me a little bit about your, the cohort of your client um, employers and who is finding the most value in your service where you're seeing the greatest uptake? Um, well, Initially, when I launched My Med Choices, we had a travel for treatment or medical tourism. So I found that the word medical tourism was a little scary for people in the US. I mean, why would we travel when we're not feeling well? 
So I initially launched overseas. So overseas is where I had most of my clients, a lot of expats, a lot of corporations that were like Starbucks is here and it's in Vietnam. So that's where I got a lot of my employers was initially building that credibility, building that up, and then coming back to the United States with a, with a book of business. So employers are looking at us more for the larger surgeries that have uh, like cancer. Uh, they'll want to look, um, they'll want to see where we're going for cancer with the best rate. Um, if we have any type of transplants, um, there's a waiting list here in the United States, whereas in Singapore, I don't have a waiting list, but then the employer is going to have, employee will have to stay there three months. So we get a lot of knee replacements. Uh, bariatric has been uh, a lot of calls for bariatric, and we've been do doing referrals uh, for bariatric, cancer, eye, um, and then wellness, we were really hit hard with. Also, um, Eric had spoke about um, the, the drug and alcohol. Uh, we've had people that are asking us about clinics and comparing prices here within the United States and other places. So we're getting dabbling in that, but it's more on a price comparison that they're looking more than anything else. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mary. We'll move forward to our third presenter. Today, it's CareTribe. CareTribe is an AI-powered digital platform that supports the dynamic needs of family caregivers and their loved ones. The startup provides access to experts in caregiving, a personalized life plan, and digital tools to support your needs when at caring for a loved one. Jack Jacques, CEO, will Good morning, I'm Jeff Jacques. I'm a physician and I've spent the last 20 years as either a professional or family caregiver. It's my pleasure to present to you uh, Care Tribe. At Care Tribe, our mission is to empower caregivers to help their loved ones to drive better outcomes, have better quality of life, and help the risk bearer um, of the care recipient or the caregiver uh, experience lower medical spend. Over 75 million Americans today um, require caregiver support, and over 53 million Americans are providing unpaid caregiver support, usually as a second unpaid job. These are multi-year journeys with very high rates of behavioral health and physical health issues for the caregiver. Um, and over a fifth of these caregivers actually wind up leaving their work uh, to help their loved one in a more focused manner. This is before the slipper tsunami that we will all experience here in America as more of us wind up retiring over the next couple of decades. We sell our services to the risk bearer, whether that be the self-insured employer or the Medicare Advantage or HMO Medicaid uh, payor. If we look at it from a uh, employer benefit perspective, it's about an $11 billion wellness marketplace. Um, from the care coordination, Medicare, Medicaid uh, perspective, it's about a $17 billion opportunity. And caregivers and care recipients together spend over $72 billion a year out of pocket supporting their loved one and their uh, healthcare journey. We believe that the family-centered care model is a model that can drive tremendous value into the channel. And, it, and typically caregivers are both under levered and under supported in helping drive these outcomes. Um, so by supporting the caregiver with better planning and access to services, we can help decrease unnecessary utilization, improve overall condition care and adherence, support both the caregiver and care recipient in the social isolation, depression, and other behavioral issues that often comes from these complex journeys and help the caregiver support their loved one if it's an elder loved one with better aging in place, improvement in quality of life, and help the caregiver avoid burnout. We do this by combining um, human expertise and clinical and predictive analytics in our platform to build life paths. And these are holistic um, plans that not only care about what is happening now and what maybe the current crisis is, but is also trying to predict what will come down the pike 
And how can you build scaffolding around the caregiver and the care recipient to avoid um, uh, future crises and burnout? We partner that with a benefit and marketplace uh, resource. So we look at, if it's the employer, we look at benefits for the employer and say, how can the benefits support this plan? Um, if there is a short gap there, how can we find then local or regional resources that can be brought to bear to help fulfill the plan and therefore help the, uh, the caregiver uh, navigate a better overall journey for their loved one? We are live with a couple of employers now and talking to a number of payers. Um, if you look at our six month data from our first two employers, you see that we were able very quickly to engage over 8% of the overall population. Many of them were in planning mode, the remainder in crisis mode. These are often women uh, in a fifth or earlier in career. Um, and when we've polled them after we've helped them with the initial navigational support and planning, we find that over 60% of uh, our employee caregivers have found increased productivity at work, that they've been able to manage their stress better and close to 90%. I'm sorry? Uh, the time is up if you want to just finish that oh, sentence. Sure. No. So our, our, our point is to drive ROI for the risk bearer, provide a complete solution, and anticipate not just current state but future needs. Thank you. Perfect. Let's go to Joel first, and then we'll go to Michael and Jen. Hi, I'm curious how um, employers find out which of their employees are caregivers. So typically, um, if you look at data from AARP and the uh, Northeast Business Group on Health, HR execs know that caregiving is a, an issue. They typically don't know how many of their employees are caregiving. If you look at uh, publicly available data, that they predict about 17% of an employee population is caregiving at any point in time. The B of A survey, I think about six months ago, would say that that number is actually much higher, closer to 45%. What we're finding is that about 22% of a population is caregiving. And some of those who are closer to HR or have some sponsorship within the executive uh, uh, part of the business will come to them asking for some level of support. They're aware, they just don't know how deep the problem goes. Yeah, great. Um, I think we've seen similar things. I I'm curious what your plan is for the out-of-pocket spend category, which is the largest, and how, you are, how your roadmap approaches that opportunity. So we look at uh, channel partnerships, we look at regional and national uh, players that we can bring to bear and try to drive uh, discounts through there. So vendor discovery, if I need to find skilled nursing facilities at distance for a loved one, especially now in COVID time, how do we find one that can actually meet need, not just have an available bed or an available uh, assisted living facility unit uh, available for that loved one? Um, so we have to do diligence on our side to understand what they're able to bring to the, to the table and how can we drive some discounts in for, um, uh, for that out-of-pocket spend for the families. Are you utilizing technology that allows for better caregiving of the family member in the home? So the answer is yes in a couple of ways. I have over 20 years in population health management as my background, but my CTO um, is a, a, a serial uh, technologist and has been looking for his own family at devices and capabilities. Our perspective is that we're agnostic of the tools, whether that be bed sensors or movement sensors, whichever ones um, uh, a specific client would like us to use, we're, we're perfectly happy to support helping get, getting those deployed and then being able to lever that data, bring it back into the platform and, and provide that uh, feedback uh, to, to our, um, our caregiver user. Great, thanks. Let's go to Michael. Hey Jeff, good to see you. Uh, you too, my friend. Question for you, uh, the vendor relationships, um, can you share for us kind of what sorts of um, vendors, products and services have been most demanded or most consumed or, or uh, kind of used on the platform? Just trying to get a better sense of, um, 
you know, the, the problems that people are grappling with and how you guys are best suited to kind of uh, service them? Yeah, so 60% of the time, our user is supporting an elder loved one and they're typically distant. Um, so typically they're looking for, um, I've had a change of state, I have to move mom or dad into, into a different kind of facility, I have 30 days to find that. And so that has been a chunk of the problem, especially in the, in the pre-COVID time. Post-COVID, those needs in, uh, have become more complicated. Uh, so, for example, uh, one caregiver we were supporting, a senior HR exec, had to drive an RV cross-country to get their dad, bring them to California from Florida to get cancer care for uh, pancreatic cancer, and then transition all of their um, medical records, insurance information, et cetera, here to, to California. So where before we were seeing a lot of issues of where can I get mom or dad, now it's been how do I better support aging in place? And then on the younger side of the spectrum of care recipients, it's really been managing uh, this new work-life balance in, in, in COVID time. How do I support my kids? How do I get things done? How do I manage my own stress? Um, have been a sort of major components on the um, special need and, and quite honestly, uh, neurotypical uh, ch uh, child spectrum of the of the caregiving um, uh, sort of milieu. And, and my last question, what's been uh, any interaction that you and your team have had with the broker and consultant community, if any, and what's been yeah, the great, reaction from them? Yeah, great question. So that they, um, we've had numerous conversations with folks like Lockton, uh, Mercer's, uh, and Hewitt and others. Um, the, the perspective there is that a lot of uh, their, in the tech and healthcare sectors, very clearly, there's increased demand for supporting uh, employees with managing, managing their own um, sort of emotional well-being and managing caregiving as a component of that. Um, also, down the, the stream a little bit, as we get to a new normal in COVID and post-COVID time, how does uh, benefit balancing support a distributed workforce that will be less co-located than before? How do you maintain culture in that manner? Um, and caregiver support is coming up specifically as a component, uh, a component of that. Thanks, no further questions from me. Let's go to Jennifer. Do you mind pulling up the slide that shows the things you're wrapping around um, that shows social work and that human element? Yep, my I, pleasure. I just kind of want to understand, A, alignment of incentives, and don't mind the noise, that's the mail being delivered in the background here. There you go. Um, yep. So, <laughs> the virtual world. So, looking at Care Navigator, so I have two questions here. One is, on the Care Navigator side, how you scale and keep assuring quality assurance, and, and do yep. they work for you? Yep. Yes, okay. so sorry, great. Uh, so, um, we do diligence on folks that have at least a decade of experience with masters of LC, uh, an LCSW with masters, a master's degree, or a Jerry Care Manager who's worked, let's say, for a payer for at least a decade and has clear experience in that space. Um, a key component for scaling is because we want this to be a SaaS uh, margin business right. is to use the analytics to socialize best practices. So mm -hmm. that we're not dependent on a single navigator's experience base to be able to drive an, an overall experience. So the okay. platform itself has to learn from the, right. uh, the navigator. Right, so the life plan takes that best advice, digitizes it, but then of course the real value add then is navigating and accessing these other things. So then that gets to my second question on benefit and marketplace resources. So these are generally then what's being also sponsored by the employer because this is helping navigate plan options. One of the things that is often striking me as a digital health investor is why aren't employers making, why aren't, there, why aren't they already incented to make sure that those under their plans are better navigating these in the first place? You know, where's the life plan, if you will, or care plan? Yeah enablement to navigate those or is it you know the kind of natural desire to suppress utilization you know because plans um are often modeling 
their risk pool for kind of short periods of time. Right. If you're talking about employer benefits versus Medicare, for example. Yep. So they don't always necessarily look at the payoff to preventing problems that might not happen for another couple of years if doing some good things now. How do you make sure that you are assessing all those benefits well and making this attractive to the employer who has some other incentive to maybe not have overutilization of these exact resources? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. So um, part of our diligence is to fully understand benefits prior to rolling out for an employer, which we can do roughly in, in 30 days. And our perspective is because we all, um, my, uh, one of my co-founders and I are physicians and have healthcare and insurance backgrounds, is understanding sort of that benefit structure and how the HR executive and employers view it, what they're paying for already, and how we can identify key component of, of benefit within the benefits that can support a caregiver better. And so as an example, for one of our, for our first employer that we went live with, they saw a quarter over quarter, a doubling of EAP utilization because we had mapped out within the platform specific component benefits within EAP that would vastly support um, uh, a caregiver like free and home fall risk assessments that was available to any elder loved one of the employee. Um, I think the perspective from HR, why do they not drive better utilization, is that they want to have a light touch on benefit. They want to make these things available. They fear getting too deeply involved in how benefits are used because they don't want the employee to feel, I'm looking at what your issues are and trying to push you into those categories. So they are likely um, hoping that either the payor or vendors will appropriately drive awareness and engagement. And I, I, I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've certainly been motivated to jump in on some things, you know, because it has a nearer term payoff to them. So I think making sure that, I, I don't know the real answer, but they're all shopping from the same risk pools, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> exactly. even if they don't take care of these problems, they end up and with another cohort in the next plan in the next plan year or after yeah. employee turnover that has a lot of the same problems. So yeah, agreed. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. We, moving on to Teatros. Uh, Teatros is the first behavioral health and social support platform that combines clinical expertise, peer communities, and infinitely scalable technology to advance mental well-being and to enable meaningful, sustained behavioral change that helps people live better lives. Salesforce, Salesforce purchased Teatros for its 52,000 plus global employees last year. Kimberly Cerrone, founder and CEO, will be our next speaker. Go ahead, Kimberly. Okay. Your time starts now. Okay, thank you. Almost half of American adults are struggling with clinical levels of anxiety and depression. This is a time bomb waiting to go off on employers because employees with mental illness are less productive and high volume consumers of healthcare services. We use patented technology to connect employees and supportive peer groups to overcome the stigma of mental illness and replace social isolation and loneliness with a sense of belonging to a community. Members of the peer group work asynchronously, but together, sharing their experiences and practicing the behaviors they learn. Everyone works at their own comfortable pace and depth. Our experts create user experiences with human touch and scientifically proven methods that meet everyone where they are today and guide them on their journey to lifelong health. Employers choose Teatros, excuse me, employees choose Teatros programs, content, and tools that help them feel better now and continuously strengthen their mental well being over time. 100% of Teatros users show clinical improvement. Independent research studies show that Teatros reduces depression levels by one third. Stress and anxiety go down by over 
stress-related physical symptoms go down by over 30%, which means that teatros can dramatically reduce healthcare utilization costs. These results takes most employees back into the normal healthy range. Employees also acquire healthy new behaviors, openness, joy, trust, and other behaviors that are associated with mental well-being, increased productivity, and effective teamwork go up dramatically. Melancholy in moderation, which is often expressed as substance abuse, consistently go down. But what's as important is that employees gain, engage deeply with teatros. A remarkable 73 to 95% of our users complete their programs. We charge less than $100 per employee per year for unlimited access to the Teatros platform. Employees can access Teatros from all 50 states and over 100 countries. Infosys picked uh, Teatros for its remote workers around the world. Salesforce provides Teatros to its global workforce. And a public school system recently succeeded. One minute selected teatros for its employees. I specialize in structuring and negotiating the business deals that help startups grow into large companies. I have graduate degrees in neuroscience, business, and law, and right out of school I co-founded a neuropeptide company that went public in 1994. I took a second company public in 1999. My co-founder is a Stanford MBA and UPenn Applied Positive Psychology grad with a bronze star. Our chief medical officer is one of the world's leading authorities on wellness. FIC heads our team of clinical and online learning experts. Together with our collaborators and advisors, our team has the deep multidisciplinary domain expertise needed to solve this trillion dollar problem. Thank you. Perfect. Let's go to Jen first. Hi. Um, you know, anytime, again, there's a human element involved, I think it can actually help some of these types of things position it for success. But it also, as with a question with another company, requires quality control, quality assurance mm -hmm. around the people. And so is it a technology-enabled clinical practice that's offering group therapy, or is it really a technology platform that has that clinical guidance behind it? It's, it's going to possibly be both, but how do you grow and keep having those who are leading group therapy? So uh, great question, Jen. Um, our goal, our mission is to provide services to the, at least the 120 million people in the United States who had no access to mental health care services um, before COVID. Now half the country is struggling with anxiety and depression. Our goal was to automate psychiatry, if you will, delivering consistently expert quality, evidence-based mental health services at massive scale to people everywhere reaching them on their personal devices when it was when it was convenient for their schedule. Right, that's the value proposition for telemedicine behavioral health. And I agree, and we've invested in telehealth for behavioral health. I'm trying to understand how you're delivering actual group therapy at scale. Are there participants and do you have to keep adding therapists? And no, how, how no. do you grow in that way? So how I, how I would respond to you is um, telemedicine does nothing for scale. It puts a screen between a therapist and a patient. That's all telemedicine does. It, does, it doesn't add one more hour of available therapy time. It also does nothing for quality control because the same people who are available for therapy, to provide therapy services in an office are available to do it over a video conferencing tool. Teatros video records um, expert clinicians 
both psychiatrists and psychologists, but also um, uh, the various medical specialties. So we can capture the expert quality that is available at, at top medical centers and academic medical centers and distribute it um, um, to anywhere in the country or around the world. Oh, I see. So you're providing content yes. that's pre-recorded and distributing that to those who then also form groups and can discuss things themselves? We, we, no, no. We, so first, yes, part of our company is a Hollywood quality video production company. Um, but we, we use proprietary software to form HIPAA compliant peer groups. There's a lot of science behind the formation of the okay. group. I'm just okay. trying to understand the business model. So the, uh, um, the, the peer groups then don't have a clinical leader. They are just peer among themselves, but they also have access to this quality clinical yes. content. So we, we would take 12, 15 people approximately, and there's science behind that. Um, we take a small group of people that have a common health challenge. They're all stressed out because they work at in emphasis. They're, they have postpartum depression. Um, they uh, they are, are caregivers for brain tumor patients. We take a group of people who have a common interest and natural affinity. We form a group that lives on our platform. It is facilitated by a trained online learning expert who facilitates the group, watches to make sure everybody's moving forward, nobody's getting lost. Okay, so there is a person involved. That's, that, that's I'm just trying to get to the, some of those answers. Um, and that mm -hmm. person is a clinical person? The it's the just facilitators are online learning experts in each of each, okay. each of our peer groups and each of our facilitators are overseen by an expert clinician, um, an expert, an expert psycho, uh, uh, psychotherapist. In addition, in some of our applications that are for patients, there could also be a, a, a physician of medical record. Okay. Um, and some of that, the human part does both um, require some consideration of risk, right? If somebody's not um, a clinician, but is a coordinator, but you have other clinicians involved. And so you do also have to scale and make sure you retain all those people. It's interesting. And yeah, the behavioral health is a huge space. Telehealth and behavioral health is not just purely that screen between the people. There are now behavioral health things that provide homework and things to do aside from just that interaction. Mm -hmm. So um, the group therapy part though is unique. That's interesting. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let's go to Joel. Hi, thanks for working on this problem. Huge area of interest for us, of course. Um, and, and a lot of my questions have already been asked and answered. Uh, I'm kind of curious about the curriculum um, and how the group comes together and shares within this HIPAA compliant arena. What's the length of time? How much, how much are you asking these members to actually go through in their, in their program? Um, so let me start the, in the curriculum, uh, we work with subject matter experts and expert psychotherapists um, to, to optimize the curricula for specific groups. What somebody who is struggling um, with a recent cancer diagnosis needs might be very different than what a veteran who is struggling with um, PTSD needs. So we have a um, ever expanding list of expert clinicians and, and uh, population health experts that help us optimize our, uh, our curricula for a target population and also for cultural sensitivity. Um, that is a significant part of our proprietary intellectual property, how we modulize the system. 
Regarding the question of how we put the groups together, the, we've already acquired quite a bit of proprietary know-how on how to put groups together. We also work with our customers and strategic partners to understand the needs of uh, 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 their, their target population. But we assemble the groups and we're increasingly uh, building um, automated technology um, as we've mastered that part of our business. And then I think uh, finally you asked the length of the program. This is meant to be an uh, to engender an ongoing commitment, both at the individual participant level and at the, the company level, um, a commitment to um, mental mental well-being. So we have, and we, we're not a one-size-fits-all solution. We have um, what we call journeys, which are short programs very topical that um, target the immediate needs of a target population. Salesforce, for example, asked us to build journeys this summer that, that address uh, racial tension, um, uh, people working remotely with a young child or a teenager at home, the grief and loss that so many of us are experiencing over COVID, uh, Alina Health just asked me this morning to create a roster program for its late stage brain tumor patients. So we have, we have mastered um, getting the right people to work with us to develop solutions that um, are on point. Some of, some of our users um, need, need and want a true dose of psychotherapy. So we have eight week programs that mimic an effective, uh, that deliver an effective dose of evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy. We also have a number of tools, things like um, hundreds of meditations, um, psychoeducation are all on our platform. Our corporate goal is to meet our user base where they are today and provide them the content, the programs, and the tools uh, they want to engage with as, as they continue along a path to, to, to uh, achieving and sustaining better ment mental well-being. Do you have any um, AI running in the background to get in front of escalations of people that need advanced care or to, uh, you know, as, as they um, change in their PHQ-9 or GAD-7 scores to try and help them um, avoid substance abuse issues, you know, the, the, common, the common symptoms that come from increased problems excellent, in this area. Excellent question. Um, yes, we, we partnered five years ago um, with IBM Research and IBM Watson, uh, we're now working with Salesforce's um, Einstein Group. Uh, we integrate into our HIPAA compliant platform third party tools, artificial intelligence tools. We are, um, you can imagine all of the um, uh, data that we're collecting from all of the conversations, the communications, the writing, the exercises. All of that is generating unstructured data to which we apply artificial intelligence tools for at least two purposes. One, we can give real information, real time information to the facilitator and the overseeing therapist um, to guide them in, in, in clinical, in, in making an assessment. Is this patient, is this, is this employee doing well? Are they struggling? Is there something we might need to call an alarm on? The second thing we're using it on is, is to understand population trends. In fact, uh, the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF just yesterday uh, published a, a really interesting analysis of our artificial intelligence for um, two veteran populations. And we're, we're, we believe we are, um, we may be the only um, 
database of structured and unstructured behavioral health data in the world. And we're looking, um, uh, we're, we're, we're very focused on, on productizing that da data and making it available. What we do with it today with the population health data is we have uh, weekly reports uh, through a dashboard and if requested in-person meetings with our customers so we can give them timely feedback on what their population is concerned about, what we're seeing in their population, so it can help them with their, their change management for their company. Thanks. Um, looks like Michael has had all his questions answered. So thank you very much, uh, Kimberly, and we will move to our um, final startup, which is Beyond Lucid Technologies. The startup is the company behind the MediView platform, electronic patient care record platform, and MediView Beacon Pre-Hospital Health Information Exchange, which connects mobile medical agencies with around 200 hospitals and public health systems to date in real time for the first time, including for COVID-19 contact tracing, crew exposure tracking. Jonathan Fates, CEO, will be our last presenter. Please take it away, Jonathan. Hello, hello, stand by, share my screen. Oh, looks like I says I'm not a host yet. Uh, and you are a host now. I'm a host now, let's see. All right, can everyone see my screen? Oh, hello, yep. let's start here. How are you guys? Thanks for having me here. Uh, just starting your timer now. All right, I am starting one on my side as well. We've got a lot to go through and hopefully I'll keep the time. So Jonathan Fight Beyond Lucid Technologies, thank you guys for having me here. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the MediView Trips platform for COVID-19 exposure tracking in the workplace. And in addition to uh, the uh, descriptors here at the bottom about our work and talking about our company, I'd like you to keep two items in mind, de-risked and profitable. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about that. So the problem that we're solving is pretty obvious uh, to all the employers here on the phone, I'm sure. Um, people are getting sued now. Uh, they're going to be getting sued more, uh, both about what they did and what they didn't do with respect to keeping their employees safe or keeping their employees feeling safe uh, in light of this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the solution needs to be one that can address a variety of workplace environments, uh, ranging from the emergency medical services environments where we started doing this work to airlines and schools and warehouses and agricultural environments and so on. Um, and so uh, what we've brought to market uh, is a derivative of an existing product that was out in the market. Uh, we essentially adjusted it based on uh, user requests and requirements and have deployed uh, in Los Angeles, in the Houston area, Connecticut, Oklahoma, Arizona, uh, all since March. We actually deployed in Los Angeles County in five days. Uh, Los Angeles County Fire, uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 coordinator for the fire department's uh, emergency operations center around COVID is here shown. That's Terrence McGregor, happy with what we're doing. And we're here looking at uh, essentially working to spread the word around this to the many employers in, this, in, in the country and the world who are looking for solutions that are not only uh, proven, but easy and cost effective to deploy. Um, so I mentioned where we've already deployed this, the deployment time has been as little as 24 hours. Um, and to date, the work has been 100% inbound. Uh, we've got people looking for solutions. And when you can have happy customers, happy partner clients, as we would refer to them, um, literally coming to you with words, quote, the screening system is working great, and we have way too many to track any other way. Uh, it really gives you a sense of the fact that there is no viable alternative uh, that seems to be working consistently from ground up that is also cost effective for both large and small organizations. Um, given the algorithms that are that go into the tech, which I'd be happy to talk to you guys about during Q&A here, uh, there are some false positives that come from the work. Um, you would imagine there's some overlap, of course, between COVID and flu and so on and so forth. So when you're reporting symptomology, there's some overlap there, but we have gotten the false negative rate down to zero percent um, and the first data on this are being published uh, submitted to the National Association of EMS Physicians uh, earlier this month. Uh, these are personnel from the Los Angeles County Fire Department's EMS Bureau talking about the success that the system has accomplished for them uh, and its use case where tests are constrained in the ability to get them or use them. Uh, some of the initial data we talk about flattening the curve in this industry we are not just talking about it we've actually done it. 
Um, and so again, I'd be happy to, to tell you more about this, but these are two examples. One is from the Houston area on the left, from the right is from Los One Angeles. Minute. Fire. <laughs> Um, and I just kind of want to give you a little sense of what this work, how it works and, and what it does, because it's really deceptively simple. Um, there's a form that the crews fill out uh, that generates, a, a, it's essentially a self-reporting form. This can be done in any employed environment. All we need in order to deploy it is a roster of their personnel, uh, which we, th we then use to aggregate patient profiles that essentially follows these folks over time. The form is quite simple. Uh, it can be accessed and filled out in about 30 seconds from any mobile uh, handset, tablet, computer, et cetera, et cetera. And we provide a ton of data to the employer, to their HR department, their administrators, whoever it is, um, in terms of being able to aggregate these folks into risk uh, cohorts, stratification, and be able to engage with them accordingly as their symptoms evolve and either get worse or get better, determine who needs to be isolated and so on and so forth. Uh, we also allow public health and safety, excuse me, public health, uh, districts, hospitals, and so on to provide that critical diagnosis back to the uh, resource in a in a HIPAA compliant manner. It is privacy protected. I can tell you all about that if you'd like. Time's uh, up. Was that time? Is that what you said? Yes, time <laughs> is up. All Thank right, you I very much, Jonathan. We'll go to Michael first. Thanks very much. Good job, Jonathan. Uh, nice, nice try squeezing it all in. Uh, very admirable. Um, so is this more about contact tracing, you know, and, and where do you play with screening and testing kind of uh, solutions? And then uh, what about referrals to actual medical practitioners, you know, if, if someone does kind of come up, um, you know, that they need to go kind of do stuff. And then I guess my, my last question would be, uh, seems optimized for COVID-19. What about other pathogens that come our way kind of in downstream years? Great questions. Um, I'll try to take those in turn and of course, happy to dig in any more detail if you need. Um, first and foremost, we are a software company. We are not doing anything involving pathogens directly. Um, the, the actual heuristic that's written in that document that I referenced, the research work uh, that's now being published is what we've essentially created um, out of, again, it's a derivative of an existing product. So when we talk about needs and market, product market fit and all that, um, is a pregnancy test for COVID-19. Um, so if you think about uh, what a pregnancy test does, it's a non-diagnostic test um, that essentially indicates risk, right? It is a risk indicator. So the idea here is that you are able to, in, the, in environments where you don't, either don't have enough tests to go around, right? Which is happening, we know, um, and can happen quicker than people realize. Um, or in environments where test results are taking a long time. So people are trying to figure out as an employer, do I send you home for seven days while I'm waiting for your results, for example? Big question, right? So the idea here is in those kinds of contexts that you can actually triage who is showing signs and symptoms that they have this nasty thing versus say seasonal allergy or flu, et cetera. Uh, we are working with LA County Fires, EMS Bureau, and some others to modify the algorithms to incorporate uh, some of those other criteria, as you mentioned. Um, but the, the real power here is the ability to provide an early indicator of, of hot spotting. Uh, and that's what contact tracing enables to do. So this could be categorized as a contact tracing solution. Uh, we like to call it uh, uh, exposure tracking uh, because contact tracing has a bunch of baggage involved and particularly the human side of it. But essentially think of it this way. And, and again, we're talking about in a workplace environment, not for consumers to use at home per se. So assume that I'm working on an ambulance, I'm working at a warehouse, on a shift, I'm working in a pork processing plant, right? I know what shift I was working on, who I was with, who I touched along the way, who I had lunch with, who I ran on a call with. I can essentially drop a pin in that person's day and track backwards around everyone they touched, right? That happens almost instantaneously. And so the ability to then say, you are, you know, you, you normally come to work feeling X, Y, Z. Today, I have an additional headache. That headache's not my baseline. Coffee didn't make it go away. Now I'm going to, I'm going to identify that your, your, excuse me, your experience today is out of sorts. I'm going to start to watch you. I don't know yet that you have a problem, but I know that you, you aren't sick enough and demonstrating enough uh, symptomology for me to send you home for 14 days. That's a really expensive go-to default approach, right? But you're also not, you're also enough out of your norm that you're reporting to me you're having an issue. 
And as such, I'm going to put you on a different in a different part of the work uh, environment today. So you're not going to be touching as many people. And I'm going to observe you in that environment for a day or two, see if you get better or worse. And so it's, it's threading this needle between being responsible and basically, you know, burdening your organization with seven, 14 days of PTO. That would be incredibly expensive to have to bear. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no further questions. Great. Thanks very much. Let's go to Joel. Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm curious how you validate the accuracy of the data when it's self-reported. Sure. Uh, actually, that, that's a great question. Um, it, it goes to the longitudinal nature of the data, right? So, the, again, the, the, the algorithms, which I won't talk about too much in public, although I'm happy to talk to you about separately. Um, and Joel, you and I have some interesting overlaps in terms of our organizational pedigree uh, to UHC, so it might be worth the conversation there. Um, your, the, the algorithm essentially identifies, again, a, a, a delta from a baseline, right? It's kind of the way, the way to look at it. So um, the, the hallmarks of COVID-19, as opposed to, say, flu or, or a seasonal allergy, are pretty distinct. Uh, and that's, that's come down through the variety of clinical you know, details from uh, World, sorry, well, World Health Organization, CDC, and so on. Um, in terms of onset of symptoms, progression of symptoms, and more, most importantly, the combination of symptoms. Um, so think of it this way. If, if, if you have a cough, that doesn't mean you have COVID, right? If that cough progresses to uh, a head cold, that doesn't mean you have COVID. If you then start having over three, four, five days, a variety of different symptoms across body uh, systems, then you have an extremely high likelihood of having COVID. Um, so the idea of, of observing these symptoms over time relative to an individual baseline. And again, because you're in a work environment, basically saying, look, you need to punch a time card, you're gonna fill out this form. Uh, it's kind of the equivalent of how this is being deployed. Uh, it becomes a function of, of can you come to work uh, if you haven't done this step? Uh, there is no P PHI going into that form. It's actually not even a, a HIPAA compliant form. Uh, we're essentially matching an employee's ID number reported on the form with a secure database that's taken from that roster, as I mentioned. So you fill out this form, you can do it before you start your day, just as much as you would clock in for the day. Um, and, uh, and then as we aggregate those data over time, it allows you to see whether the progression of symptoms is matching the expected uh, results. Now, you, you did mention um, accuracy. And again, there is some over triage that's happening because there is overlap with other concerns. But the idea is that if you have 100 people who all want to get tested and you've only got 50 tests available in any given amount of time, you need to figure out which 50 can wait, right? And so the idea is to essentially triage the process so that you don't overwhelm your availability of tests or the availability of, of personnel to do those tests. Uh, it's not to get it to zero. It's to basically say who can wait. And that, and that goes along the lines of the, uh, the flattening the curve concept. All right. So, um, so, again, so I get that. I get, I guess what, I, what I'm, maybe the, the origin of the data is what I'm, I'm interested in. I mean, if this is self reported, how can you guarantee that these workers are admitting that they have a headache or admitting that they have a little cough? I mean, we've, we've looked at other similar uh, value props and tools, and that's kind of our hangup is that people will not necessarily be honest. Yeah, they're trying to game the system, right? So the so idea- they, want to, they, need to, they need to come into work. Yeah, or, or the opposite, right? People, some people want to take the time off and get paid to have extended vacation. Uh, we're seeing both of those things. Um, sure, sure. So again, either way is a workplace problem. And so again, that's why one reason we, we don't really talk too publicly about the nature of the algorithms, um, but, but sort of the proof was in the pudding and so far as it got that, that false negative rate down to zero. Um, so, and, and of course that's where the danger happens, right? Sending people out into the world, as you say, just what you say, they need the hours. Um, so, so making you think I'm okay uh, and then sending you out into the world. Um, first of all, there is the question of if you basically say you have no symptoms and then you're observed to have symptoms and you lied on the form to your employer, you're going to have a different kind of problem. Um, and, and that's something that, again, in a workplace environment, as opposed to a consumer one, you can take seriously. If you just endangered your colleagues, uh, you know, that, that, that may end up being a fireable offense, uh, especially if you want to be able to come to work. <laughs> Endangering them and getting yourself canned is probably not the great way to do that. Um, but the, so, so one is the assumption that your people are being honest insofar as they want to be there, they want to have a continued job. Um, and, and of course, if someone, right, they report that they're not, that they're perfect and then they're hacking up uh, a, a cough and faint during, you know, on the line, you're going to have an issue with that person self-reporting. 
Um, on the other hand, again, it's not a spot a spot report. So it's not saying I have a cough today, therefore I have COVID. It's saying I have a cough today. Then as managers, we have the ability to risk stratify, right? And say, well, I'm going to observe you now. Uh, and, and if it turns out that you spiked the fever, again, I don't know that you have COVID because you spiked the fever. And I don't know that you have COVID because you don't, or that you don't have COVID before you don't. So it's the combination of, of symptoms over time that allows you to look at this person and say, are you likely to test positive on a COVID test? If yes, then I need to get you one right away. If the algorithm essentially says you're actually look like you're having seasonal allergy because by the third day of reporting your symptoms went up and went back down, maybe that was you know attack of hay fever because the leaves are starting to change color in Minnesota, um, right? And so and so that's where the combination of the self-reporting form is not just tell me how you're feeling and therefore X Y Z. It's really processing it into a longitudinal algorithm. That's what we've been doing for years, um, and uh, and so that's where again the fact that this is built on uh, a patient care reporting system that works with fire and EMS today. That was the part I didn't really get to at the end there. Um, but we've been in business for 11 years doing this work with emergency responders, uh, basically uh, repackaged some technology that already exists in that regard to be used in these other non EMS, non fire workplaces. Thanks. Let's go to Jen. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think that it is good to think about managing some of these population health problems around a pandemic in a triaging kind of way. It's always, I think it's yet to be seen how it plays into employer or employee liability, you know, because there are lots of asymptomatic people. So holding somebody to the idea that they somehow lied and later showed to have COVID, probably there'd be no claim that would succeed around that. Um, because also you're positing that the employer is also triaging and sometimes keeping somebody with a self-reported headache on the line, on the job. But the bottom line is that this kind of triaging will help overall risk reduction or yeah, keep yeah. vital factories, et cetera, going, right? Because that the false negative rate partly comes, though, from the fact that it's going through some gating of already pre-selecting factors like that there's generally good social distancing, that there are not a lot of other explanations. We don't have high rates of flu circulating right now, et cetera. Although some of the biomarkers of self-reported um, symptoms like loss of smell and taste, that's, that yeah. gets really predictive very fast. You know, that's a really good way to decide who should be getting a test mm -hmm. and who should maybe be going home that day. Exactly. So, I mean, I do think it's good to repurpose triaging technologies in this way. Um, you know, and I, when I was a college student many, many years ago, I was an EMT and everything was paper and everything was also, can we see these patients' records if they've That's had right. a stroke and they're in a long-term care facility? It was very like, boy, we want, would have wanted all kinds of digital tools, including for triage, you know, everything was a lot of verbal handoff and a lot of rewriting patient charts. It was incredible when I think about it now. But, um, you know, I think that you have to start to um, build in some way to adjust this for the, the, the employment place. Like how important really is it to keep these people there if you already know you have a couple of COVID cases there and adjusting the input that it provides the employer. You know, um, so I think you've answered a lot of my questions. I think my, my questions are more comments, just sort of, sure. you know, is, is there some um, sensitivity testing around the, around the negative, um, the false negative rate as it is, if you ended up with flu season kicking up at the same time or less, less social distancing, mm -hmm you're gonna be really relying now on that loss of smell and taste indicator, and then also relying on people reporting it. So um, is there a way to, so my question, sorry, that was a long way to also get to a question of, just like wastewater is being tested for surveillance, could you do a pooling of anonymous questionnaires into this employee body so that you could do some testing of the entire factory, et cetera, anonymously in the, in the questionnaires first, like on a, on a routine basis, like so that you're capturing that if suddenly 10 people have headaches 
and normally only two do, that you get that honest measure like that. Well, seems- I, yeah. So, so first of all, a couple couple things there, and thank you for for all of that feedback. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service on the line. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, and given your given that you work with Ben Franklin Partners, you might enjoy knowing that this work was originated at Carnegie Mellon University. So we're we're from PA and received early funding from the state. Interesting stuff. I can tell you later. Um, the, the way that you described EMS as it was when you were writing uh, is, is very very similar to how it is today. Uh, so that's actually kind of a, a lot of the root. Oh, no. of this, but it's, you really <laughs> not um, so so to your to your question about the syndromic surveillance bit, um, we actually can go further than what you just described. Uh, you described doing it inside a, a factory. I can actually do it across a city or a county. Sure. Um, yeah. So we, and, and in fact, that's what we deployed in, in within that five day period I mentioned in Los Angeles. Uh, we actually deployed a 75 hospital network across Los Angeles County, uh, such that not only can we receive and, and aggregate and analyze data from any one site. But imagine if you're Los Angeles County Public Health or Harris County Public Health in Texas, um, Philadelphia Public Health, and and being able to essentially say I can I can see all of the data incoming from from uh, various sources, whether medical transport, individuals bringing themselves into a hospital, feeding into a variety of systems, and be able to run to all of that data for trend analysis. Right, um, but and those people are though at least presenting first to some point of care. That's exactly right. So essentially, right. So, as, yeah, so, so I'm just saying, structure, right? Yeah, sure. yeah. And I'm just saying, like, being able to capture that broadly within some kind of pool yep. where you're yep. trying to monitor, you know, the emergence without so the, the having to present. Yeah. So the interesting, the interesting question. I'm sorry. I I'm really sorry. I have to interrupt because we're going way beyond our time. I really apologize. Um, I just oh, wanted wow. to get... I wanted to get to the audience poll. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Again, sorry for interrupting. Jennifer. That's okay. If, if I can take it offline with Jennifer, I think she asks wonderful questions. So I think Perfect. it'd be yeah, interesting. Yeah, please do. Um, Walter, if we could launch the poll. Great. As Walter collects um, the, uh, the results of the poll and shares it with us, I just wanted to briefly mention that for those of you interested in, in knowing a little bit more about the startups that participated today, please feel free to scroll through the chat and there should be an executive summary for each of the startups. And then next week, we'll send out an email to all the registered attendees who will um, get links for all the sessions in case you missed certain sessions today. So um, please feel free to avail of these resources. Um, Walter, if we are ready to share the results, let go, let's go ahead and do so. Great, looks like it's Teatros that has won the audience uh, poll. Let's go to Kimberly. Um. Kimberly, do you want yes, to say no, something? Sorry. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Sorry, I, I was on mute and took me a minute to respond. No problem. <laughs> do you have a few words to say? or? Well, th- uh, thank you. I, I, I just think when half, of the, when half of the country is struggling with clinical levels of anxiety and depression, people are being traumatized. Um, We need a solution. And Teatris was designed to be that solution and to be a solution that can reach people at scale. And that I suspect is what appealed to this audience, that we are a combination 
of evidence-based services that reconnect people, um, connect them, help them develop a community of other people who share their current experience um, and, and, and we can do it at scale. That's Perfect. the essence of Chiatros right there. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for participating. A big thank you to all our judges who took time out of their busy days to participate. And same goes for all the startups.